In the 1990s, in the early 2000s, Andre Agassi was one of the greatest tennis players in the entire world. And he was known not only for the intensity in which he played the game, and man, he gave it everything that he had, but he was also known for his flashiness. The way he dressed the ladies for the hair, right? Oh, he had the hair, and sometimes it was spiked on top, but it was long in the back, and man, he'd wear that bandana, and all the hair was just kind of his crown and his glory. Well, he got to be so good at tennis that people wanted him to endorse their products, and so Canon came to him, and they said, we want you to do a commercial for our Canon Rebel camera, because you're a rebel, and, and you're just going to talk about how awesome of a camera this is, and so if you remember seeing the commercial, it shows him in all kinds of ways playing tennis, and then he rips his shirt off and, and then he's standing there and, and at one point he's in a Jeep and, and as he's driving he runs his fingers through his long hair you know and, and it's all about this camera and then at the end he comes out he looks at the camera he has on sunglasses he pulls them down the end of his nose and he says image is everything and he walks off, Cannon Rebel, da, 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 you know, that whole thing. You all remember that commercial? Man, he was just known for all of these things, but he, he was especially known for his hair. But I just learned something this, this week, shattered my world. I had no idea. It's a wig. <laughs> Did you know? I didn't know. I mean, I know later you can see him and he's bald and he embraced that. But at this time... He was bald, but he wasn't ready to embrace it. And so he wore a wig. In 1990, he was in the finals of the French Open against a guy named Andres Gomez, who was ranked lower than him, but he's in the finals with him. And that afternoon, when he was taking a shower to get ready to go and play him, he put something in his hair, and his hair began to fall out of that wig. And he was petrified. He called his brother who was next door and said, you've got to come over. I don't know what I'm going to do. And his brother said, all right, we'll put some clips in there. And they used 20 clips to make sure that his wig was going to stay on his head. Because Andre said, all I could imagine was I'm out there playing and my hair falls off. And it doesn't matter how well I'm playing. All people are going to remember, millions of people are going to remember, is what happened to Andre's hair. And it just fell off. He said that every morning when he got up for years, he saw his identity laying on his pillow as his hair began to fall out in just huge, huge amounts. He played in that final and lost. I'm not saying it was because the other guy wasn't good enough to beat him. I'm just saying he lost. And he said he prayed before that match, not that he would win, but that God would keep his wig from falling off of his head. And I don't know about you, but if that's in my mind, if that's what I'm thinking of, it's going to be hard to do anything else. But finally, one day, he just let the world know, I'm bald. And like I said, he embraced that. But for him, image was everything. His hair was his image. That, that's what he used to sell his self, to sell other products. And so there was a point in his life where his image was shattered. You know, as little kids, we think there's nothing that we cannot do. I love to watch little kids, and I, I'm talking about, you know, uh, four, five, six years old, and they believe that they can do anything. They believe that if a friend straps a kite to their back or some kind of material, that they can jump off the roof of a house and they can fly. Uh, they believe that one day if they want to walk on the moon, that that's absolutely possible. That, that anything that they set their minds to, they can do it. And, and when they look in the mirror, they see somebody that's beautiful and somebody that's strong. But at some point, people come along in their lives and they start to tell them that their image is not what they think it is. And people will tell them, you're, you're not smart enough to go to the moon. You're not smart enough to be a surgeon or, or, or whatever it is that you want to do. And then people come along and say, you know what, you're kind of ugly. Or you're too fat or you're too skinny. Or, or your nose is too big or your ears stick out. And all of a sudden, these kids that feel absolutely invincible, that look in the mirror and they're fine with what they see, their image is shattered. And they just don't feel good about themselves. You know what I'm talking about? Can you remember when that happened for you? Can you remember the time where you just begin to realize that Maybe you weren't as good looking as you thought you were or, or your body wasn't as good or, or you didn't have the abilities that you thought you had and, and, and your future was limited. 
instead of being unlimited. See, at some point, our lives are shattered. The image of ourselves is shattered. It's something that Satan wants to use, I believe, to hold us down. Well, this whole idea of our image and it being broken, it started in the very beginning. That's why I had you go to Genesis because that's where this idea of image came from. You see, God had created the entire world. He had created everything. He created this perfect garden and he took man and woman. He created them and he put them in this garden. And he said, you guys have a blast. Be fruitful and multiply. E eat food, eat the fruit, enjoy the bounty that I'm giving you. And not only that, but they had the ability to walk with God. I mean, they would literally walk with God and have a conversation with him. And can you imagine what that had to have been like? For God to come up in the evening and go, hey, how was your day? Well, God, it was pretty awesome. I, 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 I found this new animal. Hey, this is really neat. Or, or, God, I tried this new fruit. Man, you outdid yourself. That stuff is so good. And Eve, she put it in a salad, and it just set that thing off. And can you imagine just being able to talk to God about your day? And that's what they had. They had this privilege. But then in Genesis chapter 3, it all changed. Because if you look in that chapter, you'll notice that Satan comes along and he, he's disguised as a serpent, as a snake. And he goes to Eve and he says, Eve, is it really true that you can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And Eve says, no, we can't eat from it. In fact, we can't even touch it. We're not supposed to do that or we'll die. And Satan said, no, 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 no. You're not going to die. Okay, what's going to happen is if you eat that fruit, you're going to know good from evil. You're going to be like God. And Satan got them to question who they were in relation to God. I, I'm not good enough who I am now. I, I'm not good enough being able to enjoy this garden and being in God's presence all the time. I, I, I've got to do no, more. I've got to be better. I've got to be like God. And if you will look in chapter 3 of Genesis, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And it's at that point that their image, their God-given image was shattered. Because they questioned who they were in relation to who God was. And I believe that's something that you and I struggle with as human beings. Because Satan didn't stop in Genesis chapter 3. Satan is going to continue to do those things. Get us to question who we are and who God is. A man by the name of Jonathan Dotson wrote it this way in the Gospel-Centered Discipleship, a book that he wrote. He said, we discipline ourselves to lose weight or climb the vocational ladder, learn new techniques, make moral decisions, or strive to be in the know, all to gain the images we so desperately want. We fight and scrap to attain our desired perception. Why? Because we believe... That whatever it takes, money, time, sacrifice, overworking, and the occasional white lie, in doing so, we believe a lie. We express faith in what is false. We rely on the unreliable. Only after we realize our tendency to build our identity on things that are untrue and unreliable can we begin to sink our identity into what is truly reliable. See, Satan wants us to be consumed with what the world says about us. Satan wants us to look in the mirror and he doesn't want us to be happy with what God created. He wants us to struggle every day with who we are. He wants our image to be shattered. And so here's what Satan does. Satan lies. He lies because he's the father of lies. That's his nature. That's his being. That's what he does. And so he says things to us like, you know what? God hates you. And the reason God hates you is because of all the things that you've done, because of the ways that you've messed up, and God can't love you because you've gone too far. You've done too many things wrong. You, you've done too many things to, to break God's heart, and so he hates you. You'll never be good enough. You have to be perfect. See, that's what God's looking for. Satan says to people, be perfect. And if you're not perfect, then, then you're outside of God's will, and God can't love you. 
And God's not going to have anything to do with you. God's not going to save you when you find yourself in that context. And he lies over and over. And then he gets the world to lie to us. And the world comes to us and the world says you're unlovable. The world says you're unworthy. You're not worthy of people loving you. You're not worthy of God taking his time to, to work with you or, or, or to do anything for you. And the world begins to whisper that in our ear and it does it when we're just children. Like I said, it starts off innocent enough. Your ears are too big. You're, you're too big, you're too small, you're too tall, you're too short. And it just comes in that way and it begins to break down and shatter the image that we have of ourselves. And then I believe it, it gets worse as you get into middle school and high school. Man, I hated middle school in the first part of high school. And here's why. I had a horrible complexion. Man, I had acne like you couldn't believe. I mean, I just broke out. And I used to say it was chocolate, so I quit eating chocolate for a while. And they said it was greasy food. And, and so I didn't try. I tried not to eat greasy food. I didn't eat chicken because I didn't want the grease to get on my face and, and break me out. And it was horrible for me because when I looked in the mirror, all I saw was acne. All I saw was bumps all over my face. And, and my parents even got me a prescription that I started taking every day that was supposed to clear that up and, and help me get better. I had the scrubs and the washing, and, and I did all that. I even, and I'm sorry to say this, fellas, I'm sorry, but I used concealer, <laughs> like women's makeup, a little thing in a tube, and I would put it on the places on my face because for me, I knew when I went to school, that was what everybody's going to see. They're going to look at Tim, and they're going to go, man, horrible face. You know, it didn't matter if I was a nice guy. It didn't matter if I was a good friend. They're just going to look at him and go, man, that dude's ugly. And that's all I could see. And I hated middle school and I hated the first part of high school till it finally started to clear up. And for me, my image was shattered because I thought that's all everybody else could see when they looked at me. I didn't give people any credit at all that they could look past a blemish and to see a person. But man, I struggled with that so much. And that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to struggle with who we are. He wants us to look in the mirror and not be happy with the person that's staring back at us. And he'll use anything he can. And he'll start when we're kids. And he'll work all the way up through adulthood. And he'll try to tell us who we're supposed to be with and what we're supposed to do and the, the, the way we're supposed to act and, and all of those things to question who we are in God. So here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. I just want you to learn some things about yourself. And this is probably not going to be new. But I think we all need to be reminded of these things from time to time. And so we're going to have some statements that are going to come up on the screen. And I want us to read those statements together out loud. And then once we read the statement, then I'm going to go to God's Word and I'm going to share with you some verses that talk about who you are. What your image truly should be when you look through God's eyes and you see yourself so when the statement comes up we're going to read those together and then I'll talk about them for a minute okay so let's go with that first statement and read it with me I am created I'm created in God's image Genesis chapter 1 says so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them I want you to know that you were created in God's image that when God created Adam and then he created Eve and he put his breath into them, he gave them a spirit, he gave them a soul, and he created us in his image. See, when, when he was creating things, and you can read the creation story in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and you see he makes the, the sky and he makes the earth and he does water and he separates the water and he does the sun and the moon. And whenever he's creating all these things, he, he stops at the end of the day and he goes, that's good. And then the next day he'll create some more and he says that's good and he creates animals and and he creates fruit and trees and all of these things and he looks at him and he goes that's good but on the sixth day when he created man and woman he looked at him and he goes now that's very good. I mean I'm pretty impressed with Mount Everest. I'm pretty impressed with the Grand Canyon and the beach and I think God you did something right there if you're gonna be impressed you ought to be impressed with those things and he said they were good but then he looked at you and he said but they are very good why because you were created in God's image to have this spirit to have this soul that no other creatures have 
So when you look in the mirror, tell yourself, I am created in God's image. Let's look at the next one. I am created by God himself. Psalm chapter 139, beginning in verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I love that chapter. And if you ever get down, go to Psalm 139 and start reading about how God created us. He used his hands. He created. Our parents had a little something to do with it, moms and dads. But God is the one that knit us together in our mother's womb. And he says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Dizzy and I were talking about this week. It just blows our mind how the more scientists learn, the more doctors learn, the more it screams that there is a creator. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the things, the miles of vessels that we have in our, our bodies that, that carry blood throughout our body to give our organs and everything, the, 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 the substance, the nutrients that it needs. And it's our brain that tells our heart to pump, to do all of that. And when you start looking at our bodies and you realize what they can do now, the, the surgeries and, and the operations that they can do, they're learning all this and it just screams to me, there is a God who created man and God created you himself and so when you look in the mirror and you go I don't like those ears it's okay because God said it's very good when you look in the mirror and you go that nose it's a schnoz I mean that thing's there God said it is very good when you look how tall or short or wide or or skinny or you look at these things realize that God knit you together in your mother's womb and you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you tell yourself that the world may tell me I'm ugly but God says I'm beautiful I'm very good the world may say I'm imperfect and, and, and I don't have a future but God says I'm going to set the course of your future I am created by God himself and remember that all right let's go to the next one I and you're probably going, Tim, I thought this was a build us up kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm created in God's image. God created me himself, made me who he wanted me to be. He thinks I'm very good. Why do you put that in there? I have to put that in there. Because that's when our image is shattered. Okay, I am a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, there came a time in our lives where we were old enough to understand, and we just said, I'm going to do it. I know it's wrong, but I don't care. I'm going to do it. Or I know this good thing I should do, but I'm not going to do it because I don't want to do it because it's not going to benefit me. And at some point, we all sin. And when we sin, that image that God had for us is shattered the world that God created where he said, Adam and Eve, you live here and we're going to have this constant communication together and, and my presence is going to be with you. It was shattered and it happens to us when we sin. When we sin, we're separated from God. And we have to know that too. Yeah, we're created in God's image. We were created by God himself, but we need to understand when we look in the mirror that, that I'm a sinner. And because of that sin, I'm separated from God. Image shattered. But let's go to the next one. I am loved. Family, you need to know that. You are loved by God in your sin. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Don't you love that it says while we were sinners? It didn't say once we got ourselves together. Once we picked ourselves up and we started getting better and we did what we were supposed to do so that we could earn God's love. He says, no, while you were in your sin, God allowed Jesus to die for you. While you're nasty and dirty and dying from this sin sickness that you have, God loved you through it. He loved you in your sin, and you need to know that because some of you here today, you've never made a decision for Christ because you think you've got to get yourself right first. 
And, and you're saying to yourself, as soon as I get my life right, as soon as I get all of these issues and, and, and all these addictions under control, then I'll give my life to God. And God is loving you in your sin. And he wants to help you deal with your sin and to be able to beat your sin. But you're not going to do it on your own. You're going to do it through God's help, through Jesus Christ. I'm loved by God in my sin. And how about the next one? I love this one. Say it loud. Gosh, does that feel good? It feels good if you believe it. If you don't, you feel guilty right now for saying it. Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8 says, In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. I am forgiven. Not because of righteous things I've done, but because of God's mercy. Because of God's grace. And God pours that grace. He lavishes that grace on us. I, I just picture it's like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Okay? It's almost impossible. It, it's not almost. You're not going to drink out of a fire hydrant. And yet that's the way God just pours his love onto us, his forgiveness onto us. And we have that because of what Jesus Christ did on our behalf on the cross when he died for us. So am I a sinner? Yes, I am. But in my sin, God loves me. And through Jesus Christ, if I will accept him, I am forgiven. Will you say that again? Say it again. Y'all need to get that. You need to understand that. Because Satan wants you to look in the mirror and go, man, I am so unworthy. I am so bad. There's no way God can, can take care of this sin. And yet he does because his grace just pours onto us and he forgives us. And it gets even better. Okay, not only does it forgive us, but how about this one? I am John 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. When we accept Jesus Christ, we become God's child. It wasn't like when our parents got together and it was our parents' decision that we would come into this world. But we're born of God. Because God forgives our sin through Jesus Christ, we become his children. And there's nothing that God won't do for his children. And so when you look in the mirror and you tell yourself you're forgiven, you're loved by God in your sin, and you tell yourself, I am a child of God, and that makes me very good. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what my family says. It doesn't matter what the people at work say. I am very good. Not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And I am God's child. And there's nothing he won't do. A couple more. How about this one? I am... 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you've received from God? I think we get lost on this one sometimes. We don't really pay enough attention to this one to understand what a big deal it is for God's Spirit to live inside of us. If you go back to the Old Testament, you look at the story of the Jews, the Israelites, and, and saw how God was with them, and he did amazing, incredible things for them, just miracles that blow your mind. But when God was with them, he was in a tabernacle, he was in a tent, and people couldn't go in that tent. They'd die. And then Solomon built a temple for him, and God lived in that temple. And he was in the Holy of Holies, and people couldn't go in there, because if you went in there, you'd die. And so that's the way the Jews, his chosen people, his children, that's how they saw God. That's how they interacted with God. But you and I have the privilege because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that God will come and live inside of us, not in a, temp, not in a temple and not in a church building. God lives inside of each one of us. 
And you need to say that when you look in the mirror and you go, I'm God's temple. Some of our temples are bigger than others. Some of our temples are tall. Some of our temples are short. Some of our temples have big ears and big noses and some have little tiny ears and tiny noses. It doesn't matter. We are God's temple because God's spirit comes to live in us. And if you think that's ugly, if you think that's not good, man, God thought so much of you. They said, I'm going to come live in you. Dwell with you. All the days of your life and that's such a beautiful thing. And then one more. Because this is important as well. How about this one? I am... I'm an heir. Galatians chapter 4 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. That's that being a child of God we were talking about. Because you, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. What does it mean to be an heir of God? Man, I can't say it as well as a guy named Craig Dennison who does a, a devotion that I get every morning called the first 15. He says use the first 15 minutes of your day and, and he just leads you through something. But this is the devotion that I had on Thursday. He says, so what does it mean to be God's child? What does it mean to be a co-heir with Christ? It means that all that is God's is yours he shares with you his kingdom. You have a father who gives you amazing gifts. You have a father who absolutely loves spending time with you. Your heavenly dad's love for you knows no bounds. His love is pervasive, powerful, and freely given. You are no longer... you no longer need to worry about whether you have a place in this world. There's no need to concern yourself with whether you will have clothes or food. You no longer have to live in pursuit of the opinions of those around you. God enjoys you. He has a plan for you. He doesn't take being your father lightly. He takes complete ownership of his responsibility. He will strengthen you, teach you, develop you, and give you a life of passion and meaning. To be the child of God is to be loved, liked, and completely cared for. Family, you're an heir of God. You're his child, which means you inherit all that God has. You will one day inherit a place in heaven where God and Jesus live. And it's a place where we won't need faith anymore. And I love that part about heaven. You and I live by faith. God, I know that you're going to do this. I know that you're going to provide. I know you've made a way. And because of my acceptance of Jesus Christ, one day I'm going to be with you in heaven. And I know that. And we're basing that on faith. But when you get to heaven, you're not going to need it. Because you're going to see God face to face. You're going to see Jesus face to face. And then you're going to really know that you're a child of God. And you are very, very good. It's not the message Satan wants you to hear. And for some of you, you're like, yeah, 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 whatever, I've heard it. It's not a problem, I'm good. <clears throat> but I believe there's some of you that you needed to hear God speak to you through his word today. Because you've been beat up by the world, by Satan, by your family and friends, by your spouse, your kids. You need to hear that you're loved in your sin, that you're forgiven through Jesus Christ, that you were created by God. And he thinks you're good. Not only good, but very good. So I want to give you your bottom line this morning, but it's going to be very different than what I've ever given you before. And this is the thing that I want you to take home with you. It's going to come up on the screen. And simply this, in Christ, I am blank. And I know what I need to fill in that blank, but I don't know what you need to fill in that blank. Because what is it that Satan has been attacking you with? What is it? Is he calling you ugly? If so, in Christ, I am beautiful. Has Satan told you time and time again that you are unworthy of God's love? Then say, in Christ, I am worthy of God's love.
If he's told you you're insignificant and you don't matter, then you say in Christ, I am significant. Maybe you don't feel like God can love you. Maybe you feel like your sins have just gone too far and God can't forgive you. Then you may need to write, in Christ, I am forgiven. So what is it that you need to hear God say today? Because in Christ, you're God's child. You're the most precious thing in the entire world that he ever created. And he wants you to know that. Andre Agassi said image is everything. I agree with him. As long as the image you're talking about is the image of who you are in Christ. And if you'll look at that, then image is everything. Would you bow your heads? Father, as we begin to think about our own lives, as we think about what we need from you, Father, I pray that we will fill in that blank with the lie that Satan has told us. Maybe just today or maybe he's told us since we were old enough to remember. I want us to realize that in Christ... We are your children. We are loved and forgiven. We're your temple and you want to live in us. And we're your heirs. We get what you got. You love us not because of what we do, but because we're your children. So Father, would you speak to our hearts and our minds this morning? I pray that our, that our image is not shattered but it's an image that's been put back together because of Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in His name. Amen. I want you to see yourself as God sees you. And God saw you as a person that was so worth it that He let His Son Jesus die for you. A death that you and I can't imagine. Pain and misery that we cannot comprehend, yet He did that because He loved you. And because he wants you to be his child, he wants you to be forgiven. The only way, though, that you can be God's child is through Jesus Christ. It's through God's grace being poured on you through Jesus' sacrifice. So if you've never accepted Jesus, you need to do that today. If you need to talk to me about what that looks like, I would love to do that. You just come forward as we, as we sing and, and, and we'll talk. Because God desperately wants you to be his child. But maybe you just got an image of yourself that is so distorted and so wrong because you've listened to Satan for so long. Tell yourself, in Christ, I am beautiful. I am worthy. I am significant. I am very good. And maybe you need to talk to God about your image this morning because you need to be confident in who you are in Christ so you can show him to people out there. You can do that where you are. Maybe you need to come forward and have us pray for you. And we would love to do that. And if you don't want to pray in front of everybody, you want to pray privately, man, come find me after service. I would love to do that and spend some time with you in prayer. Maybe you want to be a part of this church family. Maybe you say, what I need is to be around people that are going to build me up. People that are like me, that are sinners and are not perfect, but, but they're trying. You're allowing God to work. And if you want to be a part of this church, if you're a baptized believer, we will welcome you into this ministry in this church. Listen, we want to connect to God, grow in faith, and live to serve. And we want to help people do the same. So it's not about just finding your place on a pew. It's about finding your place in ministry and growing in Christ and helping others do the same. So whatever decision you have to make today, I'm going to be right over here at the side. You come and you talk to me. If God's speaking to your heart today, listen. Would you stand with me? Let's worship.